to kind of kick us off, Paul, I know Amy's Kitchen has been around for more than three decades. Let's talk about how that journey began. Sure. Thank you. It's it's such a beautiful story. It's such an honest and humble beginning to a business. Um, so just, you know, as I tell the story, uh, if it's not obvious, I'm uh, Andy and Rachel's nephew, the founder of the company. So I was eight years old when this story began. So I actually saw this firsthand through my own eyes. So often I do talk about it kind of in a very first person uh, narrative. So I just wanted to start out with that. But Amy's really began from a deep personal need. So Rachel became pregnant with what would become her daughter, Amy, and had to go on bed rest for a period of time. Uh, And Andy, unbeknownst to him, uh, as part of having a child on the way, had to start cooking for the family uh, and making the meals. Um, Andy and Rachel were very, um, they were huge foodies. They had their own organic garden in their, at their house. They ate really well. Uh, They were vegetarian. And so Andy tried to go to the store to look for convenient frozen food because he didn't really know how to cook so well himself and bring it home and was just sorely disappointed. Uh, the few things he could find that were vegetarian uh, were certainly not organic and, and his sort of telling just didn't taste good. He just felt, I can't eat this. And, and it just became that aha moment. So he just sort of thought, hey, the problem that I'm having must be uh, that must be out there. There must be more people like me who just want something that's convenient, that's delicious. Um, and he became inspired to uh, start Amy's. Um, funny enough, they named it after their daughter because they couldn't think of another name. Absolutely. And, and again, I think there was a real, um, Andy and Rachel have always been wonderful hosts. They just love having people eat around their dinner table. And they've always really thought a lot about food and the origin of that food. And when they created a food company, really their, their goal was to create food that was just as good as they would serve to their guests around their table. And, and today, actually, they often do serve Amy's at dinner parties, which I think shows how much they, they believe. And we all believe the food is really wonderful. But I think as they started a food company, both of them wanted to understand what that meant in, in their own ways. So for Rachel, you know, she had grown up, as I mentioned, with her own organic garden. She had grown that way for a long time because she just didn't feel right, frankly, putting chemicals into her garden and then eating that food. And for her, it was very just practical. Like the food tastes delicious without the chemicals. Uh, why do I need to put any in, uh, in, into them uh, or into the gardening process? And for Andy, it was a little more from a social perspective. He went out and met farmers and kind of got to understand the farming side. And he had heard a few stories uh, back in the late 80s of just, you know, l- large cancer clusters in some of these farming communities and just the impact um, that all the spraying was having on the people working in the farm or, or, or for their children. And for him, it just was more of a, you know, this just doesn't feel right. Maybe it's the precautionary principle. You know, I, I don't think all the evidence was in like it is today around glyphosate and some of these other um commonly found um, parts of the conventional ag system. And, but he just said, I just, I don't need to do this. So why do I do it? So it was, again, it was a very instinctual decision. Um, As far as sort of the vegetarian piece, that's how they ate. That was their own sort of moral compass. Um, And I just, again, they're like, if I'm going to have a food company, it's going to be connected to my beliefs around food. And I mean, the only thing I'll just sort of add to it, you know, I think it came from a really genuine place, not necessarily a business strategy that predicted organic food would become this giant industry. It was really just a, it was like, this is my, we call them our founders principles here. Just this matters to me. So therefore that's how we're going to do it. I'll say is now, you know, the person responsible for our sustainability strategy and team, uh, what luck I got. I mean, this was really made my job so much easier that they had this sort of intuition you know, 33 years ago, and we found that organic farming, you know, in addition to all the chemical benefits and, uh, you know, preventing eutrophication and just the use of these 700 chemicals in the, the day-to-day production of food, it's also a better, it's better for the climate. Uh, a lot of the new studies are showing more carbon sequestration in organic farms because of the health of the soil and uh, less reactive nitrogen it seems to be reducing global warming potential overall, more biodiversity. So really great environmental outcomes. Um, that are being produced through organic systems. And, you know, I think the vegetarian plant-based, I know that there's been a lot of press and sort of awakening to the benefit of plant-based foods from an environmental perspective. 
But just to take it inwards, we actually studied this last year. We worked with a group of uh, students at a university MBA program, and we found that our plant-based proteins have 77% less CO2E than animal-based proteins. And if you add it all up, basically, looking at all of our tofu and our beans rather than our, our chicken and beef that we don't use in our products, it's it's more of a savings of carbon than our entire internal uh, operation. So, you know, if you th if I think about all the hard work we do to get 10% energy efficiency here, it's it's so much, you know, our, because the foundation of our business is built around vegetarian food, it just makes just makes it easier, uh, you know, let alone all the animal lives that are saved because of that intention. So anyway, yeah, it's something that's been always part of us, always will be part of us. I think sometimes we take it for granted, but when we take a minute to step back and realize how powerful uh, both of those sort of founding attributes are, it's something that I, you know, I have to take a lot of pride in. Absolutely. That is really cool. I'm curious to, you mentioned the founding kind of principles. I'd, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about what some of those founding principles are. Yeah. I mean, we've kind of, it's funny, we never really wrote any of this down for the first 30 years of being a business. They just sort of were who we were, but, um, you know, we kind of, we started with our purpose and that is to make it easy and enjoyable for everyone to eat well. That's kind of the words we ended up putting towards it. And, but each of those words speaks to kind of an attribute of why we believe we exist and what we do. So making it easy, it's really about access. We want, you know, we know that people are busy. They've got jobs and elder care and parents and hobbies, whatever it might be, but we can't all sit down and make, you know, three scratch cooked meals per day as much as I think we'd all like to. So that sort of easy piece is really, um, speaks to that. Um, enjoyable. I think, you know, we, we celebrate food. We think it's something that should be an experience that leaves you better. It's not just the you know, act of getting calories in the body, but you know, the flavor should mean something. They should connect, you know, create an emotional visceral reaction to the food. And I think, you know, everything we do, we strive for that deliciousness. Um, it's super important to us. Um, this idea of everyone for us, has always been around food access. How do we make sure that our food can get to people from different income levels in different parts of the country. We've done a lot of work to connect with people with special uh, dietary needs, be it gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, vegan-based diets. Um, and to do it well, I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about. We want to be able to create this company, create this food in the way that we feel is good for the human body and it's good for the planet that we all call our home and that, you know, we try to own our externalities when it comes to the food system. And, you know, and we really believe that you can do all of that together. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to create delicious food, but have it destroy the planet or just, you know, they, they don't, in many ways, actually, the strategies that are most exciting are the ones where that really works together. Um, so, yeah, all of those have been like through lines. I mean, I think it's, uh, as I said, we finally wrote it down about 30 years in, but actually that was uh, just sort of we were getting bigger and we had a bunch of different sites. We figured we needed a little bit of common vocabulary, but really the, the animating values, they've always been part of us. And, and I think why a lot of us really love working for this company. That's really cool. You know, a, a question that we, we get fairly like surprisingly frequently um, from audience members are folks who, you know, are working for a company, you know, s similar in values set to Amy's and they're finding themselves in, in, kind of a, a sustainability role and that they've never been in before and they're super new to it. And so I'm curious, um, kind of for those folks that are like, ah, you know, just kind of getting their feet under them, what does a sustainability director do and, and what advice do you have for folks that might be new to the role? Sure. No, I'm, I'm happy to share it. And, and frankly, I'm kind of new to this role too. I've been at Amy's for a long time, but I've only been in this role for about three years. So this is actually, you know, I think very uh, near term lesson learns to me, but I guess I'll start with what we do. And, you know, what makes this job so fun is it's really a lot. You know, you kind of touch every part of the business, how we source our ingredients, how we run our operations, our plants, even the design of our products has an impact um, on the planet. But I think the thing that, you know, it's what we do, but why we do it, that for me is almost the most compelling. You know, in many ways, I, I think, as I shared briefly, I have two young girls, um, one's three, one's not even one yet. And, you know, it's, it's a scary world when you kind of think through their eyes, what type of planet are we going to leave them? Is there going to, are they going to have the clean air and the water that they deserve and all these ecosystem services? And for me, honestly, it, this job is the antidote to that angst. It lets me put this feeling to action and realizing how much more you can do through a business than you can do in your personal life is really exciting. And I think for me, at least what makes this job so much fun is that every single day, you know, not only is the work interesting, but the reason why you do it is just so fulfilling. Um, and I think, you know, at different companies, probably 
write the spec slightly different, but I, I always like to kind of think of my role in three parts. You know, there's a certain amount of work that we just own. That's my team, myself and my team's job to do. And then there's this aspect of what we inspire and how we kind of create impact beyond our own department. And then there's a bunch of collaborative work streams that we do to actually create the outcomes that we want. So some of the things we own, we own a lot of our materiality assessments, carbon accounting, you know, kind of the commitments we want to make as an organization to different environmental um, outcomes. There's a lot of pre-competitive partnerships we can work with in the space or industry working groups. So we tend to participate in those, lead some of those, uh, learn from some. The inspiring part, though, that to me is almost the most exciting. That's really about how to become this advocate you know, for the environment, advocate for social justice within your business and really help educate, coach, uh, shape company strategy and really get to this place that I think is so exciting where you don't need a sustainability director or even department anymore because your entire company understands that work and how to, how to, what they need to do, why they need to do it. And they just start making the company be what it can be. And you don't need an, a team to even be part of it. We're not there yet. I don't know if any company is really there yet, but I always find myself kind of thinking, wouldn't it be great the day that my job and my department's not needed anymore? Cause it means we've really done our job well. Um, and then, yeah, the last piece is just this area of collaboration. And there's so many parts to this. I mean, within our plants, there's work we do around energy efficiency, you know, procuring renewable energy, reducing food waste, landfill waste, uh, trying to get waste out of, you know, where we can't get rid of it just from a source perspective, make sure it at least goes to its highest and best use. Um, a lot of cool work we're doing with our marketing teams around packaging, uh, a lot of really interesting work in our supply chain about how to advance social justice, how to advance more environmental outcomes through kind of you know, the massive amount of food that we buy and kind of uh, agriculture that we connect with. Um, and then I think, yeah, your second point was just sort of advice. Um, I probably have more advice than I know how to give just because it's, you know, there's so much to know about this. But I, I think one that really for me has rung true, you know, that's my three year mark and who knows where I'll be three years from now. But it's you need to know enough to know what you don't know, if that makes sense. This is such a big space. There's so much innovation happening. There's so much you can learn from. I feel like every day I'm surprised by learning something new. And I think the place I find myself feeling a little more confident is at least I'm not blind to what I don't know. Uh, I certainly don't know it all. But I know that when I, you know, I need to learn more about life cycle analysis on this specific part of my supply chain, how do I go find that resource? How do I find that expert? And I think that's you just have to be humble. You're never going to know everything you need to know in a role like this. It's really about the relationships that you build and the networks that you have and you know the willingness to ask for help when you don't know the, the right answer. Um, the other piece that surprised me is that so much of this is relationship driven. I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to change a culture. We're trying to change a business. We're trying to change systems that our businesses with live, live within. And you're not going to do that alone. You're never going to do it alone. You, you're going to do it by creating this movement across people and people ultimately we're humans. We have to develop empathetic relationships with those that we work around. And so, so much of this influencing, advocating is really the most powerful part of the job. When I kind of went into this, I was thinking it was all about like proficiency and scope three carbon accounting. Sure, that's important to know some of that. But really, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how compelling your materiality assessment is if nobody wants to change for it. So um, I think that almost like the internal salesmanship is really, it, it's a lot. Um and maybe the last thing, I just think you got to be brave in this space. There's a lot of pressure to greenwash, to create PR stunts and accounting tricks. And, you know, part of your job is to hold your company and your industry accountable to what they're not doing well. So, I mean, even a company like ours that does a lot of things great, we're not perfect by any means. And sometimes you have to have hard conversations with departments or the owners of your company about something that isn't living up to what you, you know, to your ambition and to your vision in this space. So it's definitely, uh, you got to put yourself out there at times and, and be okay with that. But again, it's a lot of fun because you're doing it for a really good reason. That's awesome. I'm, I'm so curious in terms of that kind of internal education and kind of bringing everyone along on the journey with you. What, what's kind of, what was kind of like the, or what is the hardest part of that? And, and do you have any advice for other folks also navigating that? I think you've got to just make sure that, to be empathetic that everyone is in their own place in this learning journey. And just because you don't get an answer, you don't like what you hear, doesn't mean that someone's intention is wrong. It just might be that, you know, whatever brought them to this place in their career and this place may not have had the benefit of learning about the impact of certain business practices on the planet or how an action might have this, you know, have this externality that often most companies just don't even 
consider and not judge those folks who are at a lower or different place in their learning version and trust that they will see the light if you give them the effort and time and you connect and know the world. I mean, it's really interesting. What I've kind of come to learn is that you can connect with any human on a somewhere around environmentalism and the health of the planet. I mean, it might be a hunter who's, you know, not your traditional, you know, kind of San Franciscan Prius driving individual, who, which is where I live and, you know, actually maybe doesn't agree with you on a lot of areas of climate policy, but they've grown up camping and spending really wonderful time with, you know, their parents and now their children in nature. And when you talk to them about that experience, that feeling that what nature provides them, all of a sudden it's a completely different conversation when you were trying to talk about carbon tax or some other thing that's well, I think is needed, but might be a little more, a um, little more uh, controversial to some. But I think it, ultimately it's about finding out what animates that person, and then you know it's a very human approach. I don't think there's a one size fits all. I have one content strategy, and the whole world loves it. The other thing I would just say is experience. I mean, we did this. It was actually my first couple of days on the job. I got thrown into a literal dumpster of trash, and we spent two days quantifying every single piece of waste that came out of the back of one of our plants, and. We had like 40 buckets and we went down, okay, there's an earplug. This has got to go here. This is a hairnet. It's got to go here. This is a piece of dough. It needs to go here. And we spent literally two days pulling this thing apart. I have never, and I never can, and never will think about waste in the same way again. I mean, it was so powerful because you really see it, you feel it, you smell it. It's not just some number that you look at on a spreadsheet. This is, this is real stuff. And I, I think trying to create those experiences, I, I don't think you can get everyone in the business to spend two days in a dumpster, even though I, I'm certainly going to try, you know, I think we can get enough people that get a little bit of that feeling that they can then, you know, share, share their learnings in a way that's so much more authentic than, um, again, just talking about something in the abstract. And the same thing can go for supply chains. You go out and you actually see what our farm workers do. You see the impact of farming practices on, on the environment, and it'll change your it'll change who you are and it'll change the way you think about food. And I, I'm pretty sure just about every environmental impact, if you really go to that source and you, you feel it and you smell it and you see it and you talk to the people who are the most closely affected by it, it, it that's what really creates change much more so than, you know, kind of um, a training in a training room type of environment. That makes so much sense. There's no replacement for those like real life experiences for sure. Um, Speaking of which, I, I, you all are huge in the organic agriculture space. I, I'm curious, can you kind of explain to listeners who maybe don't know the intricacies of it, like what is the difference between traditional agriculture and organic agriculture? Sure. No, it's a great question. Um, there's a lot, but I think in its most basic sense is that organic, it's really avoiding the use of over 700 toxic chemicals that are traditionally used in farming or the production of food. Um it's a regulated system. It's actually uh, governed by a public-private partnership. So what I mean by that is a group of private companies, Amy's being one of them back in 1987, we all got together and we said, we believe in a different form of agriculture, but we want a standard and we want something that we can look to that's objective, that we can communicate about, that we can use uh, as we try to transition our supply chain to this vision that we all had. And uh, it was happening in all these little localized ways in different communities and different pockets of the country. And we, uh, together with a bunch of certifiers and other food companies, came together and we helped create this national organic program, which created the organic seal and created sort of the rules of the road about how do you farm without the use of all these chemicals. And those could be pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. Um, and what's really interesting, even though that's, you know, the simple term is it's not, it's avoiding the chemicals, really at the end of the day, what it's actually doing, it's a nature-based system. When you don't have that chemical arsenal to, to sort of take out all the bugs and, you know, create a sort of monoculture system to farming, you have to look at soil health. You have to look at non-chemical techniques like crop rotation and selecting really highly resistant varieties um, of plants, using nutrient waste management in effective ways. Um, in some ways, you know, while traditional ag might try to just get rid of any living thing that's not the plant it wants. We actually want living things. We want the enemies of our pests in the field. And, you know, if you're, if you're just taking it all out, you take it all out. So we're trying to create a nat a nature based system, something that's actually biologically complete as much as possible. Um, it's also GMO free, which is something that I think a lot of consumers are looking for, but it, it kind of goes back to the idea of really using nature based systems. And I think the thing that really, I, I always, I don't know if, 
the broader world understands how accountable organic is. I mean, it really, every farm, every process or every step goes through annual third party certifications where they, you know, their practices are looked at in depth, their paperwork, how they actually operate and keep policies. And it's, and it's being done at scale. So there's some interesting small scale ideas out there, but none of them are working on a national now global level in the way that organic is. Um, so yeah, I think it's something that really works. It, it's for us. It's it's uh, is it perfect? No. Is there room to improve it? Yes. But I think in terms of a something that you can go out and guarantee is doing a certain set of things. There's nothing else like organic out there in the ag space today. That's really cool. And that was kind of in in kind of partnership with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, right? Like they looked to you all in, in this group of of other businesses. I'm curious. Do they come back to you all or is this almost like a working group where it's like, hey, so, you know, 30 years ago we said this was the standard and now we've discovered, yeah. hey, maybe we need to, change, you know, update this a little bit. Like, is it an ongoing evolving piece or is it a little more set in stone? No, it is. It's designed to be an evolving and forever changing. It, it needs to meet, you know, the world is changing, the climate's changing, uh, what we know about ag science is changing. So it's very much designed to be a... Uh, to allow for accountable continuous improvement. And so structurally how it works is there's a group called the NOSB or the Natu National Organic Standards Board. And most of the kind of rules around organic come through this board. And this board is made up of, of academic stakeholders, farming stakeholders, brands. Um, and like any kind of standards board, they assess the evidence on both sides of a particular suggestion or idea. And if it has merit, if it fits the sort of founding values and intention of organic, then they'll pass it forward. And then uh, the National Organic Program, which sits within the USDA, will look at those recommendations. And if they do their job the way they're supposed to, they will turn those into rules. Now, to be totally candid with you and, and the people listening, it, this could be more efficient. You know, one of the things that as an industry, we're a little frustrated with is how slow the evolution and the continuous improvement of the standard has been. And we'd really like to see that move quicker and actually move quicker and get more accountable. So a lot of uh, what we're asking for is actually to make organic more robust and a more difficult standard, because we think that's really what it needs to fully live up to the, you know, the value system that, that we're all behind. So the process is there, but I, I you know, I think we would, uh, we would appreciate as an industry a little quicker use of the process that is supposed to be helping us with this evolution. And, you know, that's just why we have trade organizations. It's why we advocate. And it's something that I think, you know, quite a few organic companies are getting more fired up to continue to allow that continuous improvement to work in the way that it was intended. That's really cool. I'm, I'm curious for uh, folks that are listening that are like, oh, I want to help, you know, be part of pushing that forward. Are there ways mm -hmm. for maybe folks who don't work at an Amy's or maybe just your, you know, average person on the street to kind of lend their voice to that? Like, is there legislation or advocacy sure. groups or things that folks should know about and get involved with? There are, you know, and it's interesting, like it, we're such a diverse industry. There's a lot of different places in which to participate, but some of my favorites, I really like the organic center. They're more focused on the science of organic, but they do have occasionally some advocacy suggestions, but they're a great place to just learn about what organic's doing and where organic's going. A lot of their work becomes then the basis for what we ask for in terms of the improvement of the standard. And I've always just really appreciated environmental working group. I mean, Ken Cook, who is the president, is one of the early pioneers in the space. He really helped advocate for the organic standard. Um, that group really knows, um, and they do a lot of farm bill work. So certainly around farm bill time, they will be out there with the kind of policy prescription that will really help protect and promote and grow the organic uh, industry and the organic systems in a, in, a, in a responsible way. And I think that's the important thing is, you know, there is there's a lot of stakeholders here. So you want to find someone who's trusted, but who knows, you know, the realities of what it means to manage something that has some scale today. And the scale is a good thing because if we made organic too small, then nobody can eat organics. Too few farmers can grow organically. So, you know, there's also, there's also like most industries, a little bit of the tension. Should it stay kind of small in what it once was? Should it become a big part of the food system? If it becomes a big part, how does it not become too big and lose its sort of moral compass and value? So, all of that is true in our industry too. And I think that's what actually makes it such a fun industry is that we can have all of these viewpoints and, and strive the best we can to come to consensus. So, uh, but yeah, I would, I would definitely recommend checking out some of the work the environmental working group has done on farm bill, organic center, great resources. That's really cool. Um, I, I'm curious too. Uh, I know that 
you all recently, I think, passed the one year mark of being a certified B Corp. Um, yeah. How how did that come about? What 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 drew you all to B Corp certification? Yeah, no, it's a it's a really great question, and you know, B Corp's been a, it's been a wonderful learning journey for us. You know, I think it actually started with. Um, we, we actually started kind of looking just at sustainability frameworks. We were, you know, as a team, we were like, we want to be able to measure our progress, you know, guide some of the continuous improvement, help make sure that we can share what we're doing well. So we started exploring a bunch of them, but B Corp quickly, quickly kind of rose to the top because, you know, for a few reasons, I think it just partly linked to that early foundational DNA of who Amy's is, that idea of we can use our business as a force for good. We just, we loved it. But the thing that really differentiated B Corp and, is that it doesn't just look at policies and practices, but it looks at the impact your business actually has. It looks at your business model. So, you know, there's there's oil companies who make net zero claims. I mean, it could, that, there couldn't be more of a just, how does that work? You know, and like, we just didn't want to get into that. We wanted to be in a peer group and we wanted to use a standard that actually cared what it was we did, not just how we operate. And B Corp is really, really amazing in that it has this impact business model component, really looks at the impact your business has, it has the performance standard, which does look at a lot of policies and procedures, but it also kind of clears just, does your business create environmental or social risk in a significant way? And if it does, you're just not, you can't be a B Corp. And I think there's something really, I don't know, for me, it felt good. So that's kind of why we chose um, B Corp. Um, as I said, it was a big process. I mean, we're, you know, mid to large size food company today. I don't you know, in the grand scheme of food companies, we're pretty small, but, you know, we're certainly in the B Corp community in the sort of mid to large size. And so, it definitely was a, it was a big lift. It took us a full year of time to really go through the whole assessment and connect all the right different departments and business disciplines together. Um, you know, we did the whole third party audit, which, I mean, it's a really robust standard. I was really impressed with the caliber, what we had to present, what we had to show forward. Um, it really, uh, it was meaningful. But I think the thing that really was so exciting about B Corp for us too, is that it wasn't just uh a check the box, here's a static place in time, but it really gave us this framework that we can now integrate into our business. So, you know, we are using the B Corp standard in our strategic planning efforts. We're using them as KPIs and metrics or parts of it in all sorts of different areas of the business. And, you know, today there's probably, you know, I, I, my, my guess is our next certification round, we'll probably have 30 to 40 different people working on components of it. That's how far it's spread into so many different places. And that that's just fabulous because it gives you that ability to really you know, understand where, where your biggest impact, you know, or, or your biggest opportunities lie that keeps you on track with how you're addressing them. And then ultimately gives you something you can celebrate when we get there together at the end. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious what, um, what would have, would have been some of the biggest, I know it's only been a year, but would have been some of the kind of biggest benefits or, or kind of rewarding moments of being a B Corp so far? Yeah, I think, you know, again, I think the internal engagement, the amount folks who have come to know our business in yet another new way, but in a good way, has been really powerful. I think one of it was also nice. It just somewhat recognized, you know, Andy and Rachel as founders that what they did 33 years ago, maybe wasn't as crazy as a lot of people thought it was back then. And it was a little bit of a nice recognition, just that, Hey, you know, starting a company with this value system, with this mindset, actually, uh, it became popular, you know, who, who would have known 33 years ago, back in the late eighties, that this is actually how we talk about capitalism today, or at least the capitalism of the future. So, um, you know, and I think the other thing is beyond Amy's, I just think this whole movement has this really unique opportunity to redefine capitalism. And for us, that's so exciting that, you know, if, if Amy's, you know, and really even B Corps weren't this sort of unique group of early leaders of something new, but if that's just the way business was done in this country around the globe, we'd really have a more hopeful future. And I think for us being part of that and being able to be part of that community of companies and learn from them, be inspired by them, help inspire that forward to other, that, that's so, it's just a wonderful, yeah, just, I don't know, like-minded cohort of allies on a similar place in a similar way that really, it feels good. It's, you know, it's, I guess it's a movement in a way that we uh, were really, when we started it, we were thinking of it more as a standard and it really became more of like something much bigger than that. And that, I guess, was a pleasant surprise. That's really cool. I'm curious, what advice would you have for anyone that's maybe, you know, just dipping their toe into the B Impact Assessment or is thinking about uh, pursuing B Corp certification? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, it's, it's it goes deep and it goes wide and you have to be prepared for that. I mean, it touches on, you know, workers and how you, you know, everything from compensation to safety 
it looks at all of your traditional DEI metrics and kind of your internal uh, measures of social justice. It's going to go deep into all of your environmental practices, both within your business and within your supply chain. It's going to even look at the impact you have on customers and your governance models. It requires a legal change to the very foundational documents of your business. So you got to you got to be ready for that. It takes a lot of different stakeholders in a business to address all of those areas, both the, you know, in some cases, the changes that have to be made, but in most cases, just the investigation into the way that you're showing up today. So, you know, if you if you're trying to do this from the perspective of just like a sustainability team alone, you're probably going to have a hard time. I mean, it needs you need ownership commitment, you need stakeholder commitment. And you and it's not just at the very top, you're going to need it from a lot of supporting departments too, who are going to be spending a good amount of time. But I think again, that's also what makes it powerful. So leaning into that, I think is a really uh, important part of it. And I think the other thing is just be ready to be uncomfortable at times. I mean, it's you don't go through a process like this without learn. You know, it's not like just check the box. You're doing everything perfect. I don't think any company could do the B Corp assessment and come away with a perfect score. It's not designed that way. And it's, it's, it'll open your eyes to some externalities, some ways you're showing up that probably you're not going to be that proud of, and you're going to feel a little bit uncomfortable about, but it's also really good because that's the, that's the meaningful stuff that you're finding that can really help you get to the next level. And just lean in. I think, you know, again, it's not an easy journey, but it's worth it at the end. You'll end up with something, you know, again, even if the external part, even if there's no benefit from the external world, I think just the internal benefit alone is well worth it. And then, of course, it's a nice way to be able to communicate to the greater world about what you're doing. But I almost see that as the secondary benefit. I think what you learn about yourself and how your own company learns about yourself is is probably the the most important part in my mind. Absolutely. And and I know a, a big kind of section within the B Impact Assessment is is workers. And with Amy's mm-hmm. being the incredible kind of values based uh, company that you are, I'm I'm curious what um what what kind of uh, ways are, are you all taking care of of your employees and your and your team as well? Yeah, thank you. No, it's definitely one of our kind of founding va- values to take care of each other. And you know, we do it in a lot of ways. We do it. You know, just through the kindness we try to show each other at work, the way we try to, to do our best to listen to all voices, empower people, not you know be dogmatic about hierarchies and structures, but really value you know the, what we learn from people at any level in the business, and, and that's something that you know it's it's cultural, but it's really important because I think for for a lot of folks, it's they want to know they matter at work, not just have a job at work, and so that I, I think first and foremost. But we've also looked at some of the you know the big challenges our employees have had and really tried to solve for them. So, you know, for, for one of the, the big programs we've done, we found that a lot of our uh, employees, especially Spanish speaking employees who may not have grown up in the United States, they weren't using their health uh, insurance and in, at least to visit primary care doctors are often waiting to get, you know, to a place where people are getting too sick or they just were going to the ER when they didn't need to. And we really tried to understand why is that, you know, is it an education gap? Is it just not having access to healthcare? And we found it was a lot of things. Sometimes it was timing. Um, you know, I, I start work at six in the morning and, you know, I, I, or I'm on a late shift and I have to, you know, childcare responsibilities in the morning and I just can't get to a doctor in the normal eight to five. Sometimes it was language issues. Sometimes it was just not understanding how to access care. And so we ended up designing and building our own healthcare centers at all of our plants that are really, um, incredible. I mean, it's fully bilingual care. Uh, you go into uh, your your session, you get 30 minutes with a, with either a doctor or nurse practitioner, and they really take time not just to treat your symptom, but to get to know you as a person and know what how to create the sort of combination of life cycle, uh, lifestyle and medical choices that will really help create the best outcomes. Um, and we've just seen such incredible outcomes from it, just a healthier, uh, more vibrant workforce, people really getting the care they need in a, in a much more proactive way uh, rather than waiting till they get uh, sicker. And, and we've done this just, again, it's been something that um, we're just really proud of it. it. It's it had the impact that we had. Um, we've done some other cool things. I know one of my favorite programs is our scholarship program. So for a lot of employees, we offer uh, scholarships to their children. And so now we actually are, seeing more and more of our employees' children coming to work for us in professional capacities, in some cases being the first uh, first person in their family to have gone to college. And so that's always really nice when you kind of see that program working. And of course, you know, we'd be happy for them to get any job. It's not like there's any uh, requirement to come to Amy's, but it's always nice when we kind of see those those uh, returning alumni. Sometimes they've done internships with us in the summer and then they're coming back and working with us full time. Um, those are the big ones. I mean... I think if I missed anything, I think that that covers the big parts. 
That's really cool. And and all of those on-site health centers are staffed with bilingual doctors, right? For your Spanish speaking mm-hmm. employees. That's so cool. I'm curious Absolutely. what what went into creating those on-site health centers and and why was that why did that yeah. feel like such an important kind of piece? Yeah, as I said, I think if, you know, people aren't getting the health care they need, it's very hard to, you know, be a good family member, to be a good parent, to be a good employee, and it's just, you know, you have to take care of that physical health it's just it's it's so important to having a good human existence but what went into it i mean first of all as i as i mentioned briefly we really wanted to understand what type of care did people need what was blocking them from uh, achieving that in sort of the more traditional healthcare settings we also wanted to make sure that we really respected that employee provider divide i mean it's you're, you're divulging very sensitive information about yourself um, and we wanted to respect that confidentiality so we actually ended up doing it through a partnership we brought in a group called vera whole health so they were able to really run the healthcare clinic because again we're not doctors we make food uh, we don't know how to run a practice and we wanted to give employees that sort of comfort that you know this isn't you're not talking to somebody who's going to go talk to your manager you know you're talking to a doctor and all of the HIPAA and all the other compliance things are being taken care of um, correctly but what was really cool about the relationship is we could talk a lot about what kind of resources did we want to provide so we wanted to have these longer um, sessions because you know sometimes you get in there you get 10-15 minutes you barely can even talk about what's wrong before you're being shuttled out. We want. Um, we also wanted to have an annual physical be part of it, where we really had that moment to check in how you're doing and to be able to then create kind of a wellness coaching plan from that visit. Um, again, you mentioned that the the for us we found out it'd be really important to have bilingual care, not just for our employees but often for our employees' families who also can come to the, to to it. Um, and then for us, we also we wanted to be affordable. So for primary care at our at our onsite, it's no cost to you. There's no copay. You just come in and you get the care that you need. So I think for us, we were trying to remove all those barriers that might have prevented people from getting what they needed. Um, and I think we're successful at it. So um, yeah, no, it's definitely, it's a, it's a great program. And, you know, we really believe in this model. So if anyone who's listening to this is interested and wants to connect at some point, you know, we'd be happy to make relationships or connections to some of the groups we worked with on it. Cause we think this is a really, you know, for companies like ours that, you know, have a large on-site workforce like we do, who might not have had great traditional access to healthcare in the past. I think this is something that, that works well. That's amazing. Oh my goodness. Are there a couple of like resources that you would want to just throw out there for people to have like a starting glance at? You know, I could, I don't want to ad lib and get the wrong one. So I'm just going to start with Vera Whole Health because that's the one that <laughs> I know. Uh, we could probably follow up with a couple more. I just, uh, I wasn't as deep, personally, I wasn't involved in like the detailed rollout of this. I was uh, obviously been a, I go to it. It's my healthcare clinic. So I can speak to it as a, as a patient, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to steer anyone the wrong way. So I'd probably uh, follow up with something. Okay, cool. And I can make sure any, any of that stuff just lands in show notes too for folks. Uh, to make okay. that super easy. Um, so, and what about the, the larger community too? I, I, I feel like I, you all are also super enlarged, uh, super, super involved in the larger community. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's always been kind of part of our, our ethos and who, and who we are as an organization. I mean, in some ways, you know, we serve multiple communities, right? We have kind of our community of customers and, I think in many ways we try to serve them by keeping our, our food affordable, as I mentioned earlier, kind of, you know, addressing unique dietary concerns like gluten-free or vegan or soy-free diets and being available in places where people can find us easily. So that's sort of kind of our, our broad customer community. Uh, on our actual local community, the ones that surround our businesses and our, our kind of operations, we do a lot through both food and monetary donations, uh, and especially food. I think as a food company, we have such a unique opportunity to provide um, to provide great meals to people who need it. And that couldn't have been more true during the course of this pandemic. So just as an example, on the food side, we gave about 700,000 meals to people in 2020 uh, through the course of the pandemic. So um, knowing that there was just a lot of food insecurity and people needed that, and we, we uh, did that in partnership with different food banks, different community organizations, it really depended on, on the location. Um, you know, we've also, I guess this is more on our employees, but it was also our, hitting our communities as, you know, we were sadly two of our three locations have been impacted pretty significantly by, uh, by fires in the last couple of years. And that's, uh, really required rethinking a lot of, a lot of, 
there's just so much support that was needed in those moments. So, you know, for employees, a lot of it was just even giving them housing, trying to get them into a hotel room and just paying for that, just making sure at least we took where are you going to sleep tonight off the table, um, at least while they figured out what their next steps were, provided legal advice to, to, to those employees about how to deal with insurance claims and how to try to make the best of what was really a tough situation. But we also tried to, again, kind of look at not just our community of employees, but look at our actual you know, the, the full communities that we were operating in. So, you know, for example, during Santa Rosa, we, we opened up our, we have a drive through restaurant, which is one of our sort of smaller business units that we're uh, experimenting with right now. We have three of them that are open. Um, our drive through restaurant just became like a community hub. We, we offered free food to anyone who was displaced, evacuated, lost a home, was a first provider, did that for the f- full first week. And, you know, it was it, it wasn't even organized because it happened so fast. It was just like, here's food, have it. You know, it was not there was no like testing of it. It was just doing what we could to 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 get a warm meal on somebody's plate. And then we tried to you know later into it, really tried to extend that food support out to some of those different shelters and first providers. So, you know, sometimes it's really organized, like our our food donation program is well established. Sometimes it's just meeting the moment of where we find ourselves and being nimble enough and agile enough and just knowing that look, let's just focus on caring and. We'll figure out the back end of this later on and we'll just do what's right in the short term. And that's always kind of been the way we show up for our, for our local community. So, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're a relatively large employer in, in the couple communities that we operate. And so for us that, you know, there are partners as much uh, as anybody. And, and we do really try to, to show up, be that in, you know, the school system, just local nonprofits, really, you know, the parades that happen in your local hometown, you know, we, it, it all happens in different ways, but, uh, we really do enjoy getting to know the communities that we we operate within. Oh my gosh, that's amazing! And if you all ever wanted to put a drive-through Amy's in, oh, I don't know, Portland, Maine, I'd be pretty psyched about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I will add it to the list. We have a lot of, I think we're at like seven hundred and fifty different location requests at this point that have come in some way or another. So. You may be on there already. I'd have to go look, but uh, yeah, we're we're kind of staying on the West Coast for our first, you know, first few years of this. But someday, that's amazing. That. That's amazing. I didn't even know you all were doing that. Is that is that like new? Just in the last few years, or I think I'm trying to remember. If I guess it's five or six years now. Uh, we started here in Ronert Park, which is kind of right by our headquarters, and yeah, it was it. You know, it's so it's the same purpose, just a sort of different interpretation. So you know, rather than trying to create a healthier, tastier version of frozen food. We were doing the same for the drive through world, just, you know, kind of knowing we're on these road trips and, you know, I won't, I won't, I won't name drop the usual suspects. Most people know what's out there in terms of true, like drive through fast food. And we were like, can we do a really delicious organic version of this uh, all vegetarian and do it in a really fun, fun way. And I think that's kind of what we've, we, we've created. So uh, all the foods cooked there, it's not, you know, it, it's a whole different business in the sense, but it's still connecting to that same idea of just, being convenient and, and sustainable and, and uh, fast for people. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. That's so exciting. I'm really excited about the future of that. That's, that's super fun. Um, Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about, um, just a little bit about kind of investing in one's local community. I know you, you I mean, you've mentioned a lot of incredible work you all are doing, you know, for maybe making the argument to, businesses that are like, oh, we're going to focus on the environment. And like, we're not going to worry so much about that community stuff, like Mm -hmm. kind of framing up why that's so important and also intersects potentially with the environment work as well. Yeah, it's really almost impossible, I think, to separate, you know, kind of social outcomes from environmental outcomes. You know, if you're not taking care of people in their communities, they're not going to take care of the environment. I think that's pretty well proven at this point. And when you take care of the environment, you're also taking care of people. I mean, if you look at you know, how often those that have the least means or come from, you know, marginalized identities are, are dealing with the most of the environmental, you know, pollution, air quality, water issues, it, it goes in both directions. So I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Those two are deeply interwoven. Um, I mean, I think, again, there's sort of a couple different levels of community, right? I mean, I think we even see our farmers and farm workers as part of our community because, you know, they are, you know, while they might not be immediately adjacent to us, they're still very much part of our our reason for being as a company. We wouldn't exist without them. And I think we have to think of them as sort of a partner in all of this. So, you know, clearly there's things like providing food aid, but I think there's also this idea of creating better economic outcomes. So how do we create a food system in which, you know, all people who work on a farm can earn a living wage and can work in, 
humane conditions. I mean, that's something we can do through our sourcing policies and practices and our expectations of who grows for us. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of work recently around kind of high risk screening and how do we look, especially, in, you know, we get most of our ingredients do come locally or local ish, you know, kind of Cal, you know, California, Washington, Oregon, sort of Midwest depends on the ingredient, but we do get some spices, for example, out of India. And so, you know, some of these further field communities, which we're still, they're still part of us in a way, how do we really look to make sure that conditions there are also adequate? And so we've been moving, you know, in those cases, we've been looking at a lot of things like fair trade and reinforce alliance and other certifying mechanisms, just because it's harder to be there day to day. But um, yeah, I think it's important, you know, just not to, you know, not to, you know, it's, it's both. It's the communities physically that we operate, but I think it's the communities of people we touch throughout the course of, of uh, managing our business that are, that are so important. So I think, I think I covered a lot of the other things we do around food and monetary donations. I don't have a whole lot more to add on like specific local community programs, only to say that, you know, they all know you, they are your employees. They are, you know, the, they're the families of your employees. And, you know, if you can have that presence and be seen in a positive light, it's just going to, it's going to make you a better company. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious, what do you think needs to change in the food industry at large in order to make a real measurable impact on the planet? Oh, there's a lot. That's a big question. Uh, where to start? I mean, I think at some point it kind of goes back to start like owning our externalities more. I mean, the, you know, food touches everything. It touches culture, it touches health, it touches the environment. And I think often as the food industry at large, you know, it may be broader than just the organic we don't, we don't own our externalities. We, you know, we put a bunch of chemicals in the soil and they go into a local water system and that becomes somebody else's problem, not our own. Or, you know, we run these concentrated feedlots with incredible amounts of methane release and other climate pollutants. And yet we're off the hook. It's not our problem. I think, you know, if the food industry wanted to be honest with itself, it's to start paying attention to these outcomes that we're creating outside of our direct, like, direct running of our business and own some of that, try to make that a, a better place. I mean, I think the whole connection between food and human health is also a really fascinating one. It's so much of our, the calories we produce are not creating good health outcomes in people. And if, you know, if we could prescribe healthy food, you know, instead of maybe so many pharmaceutical drugs to a lot of reoccurring, you know, kind of health issues, what would that really mean for our food system? Because I think actually, if you, if you could somehow account for those externalities, and put that money back into creating really high quality, high value, high nutrition density food, I think ultimately it would actually be a, a I don't want to use the word cheaper. I hate to use the word cheap and food in the same sentence, but it would be a more, I think the values would be more aligned because, you know, ultimately we prioritize cheap food, but because of that cheap food, we, we pay for it in so many other ways. So I'd love to see ways to tie that more together uh, through policy, through consumer choice, et cetera. Um, you know, I think transparency, we touched on a little bit with B Corp is also really important, you know, and, and that's that allows at least consumers to make informed uh, choices about the impact the food system is happening. Uh, and we're getting better in that way. I wouldn't say fully there. And I think, yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to think of anything. I think that's that's the big pieces. Yeah. Um, I know something that the, the brand put out there is that Amy's is not in the business of making shareholders happy. Would you say balancing mm -hmm. values with profit is inherently complicated? I mean, it is complicated if your only outcome of success is making money for your shareholders. You know, I think if you look at it more from a perspective of how do you optimize for all of your stakeholders, it can actually still be quite easy. The, I, the problem is that the incentives aren't always lined up. You know, it's actually this question when I saw it, I was kind of. I heard it sort of this example came to mind. I was at a, on a webinar a couple of days ago and it was showing that 92% of the S&P 100 have made commitments to emission reduction, but only 7% of the S&P 100 is doing anything to help the Chamber of Commerce align its climate position with climate science. So they basically funding a organization that's trying to get, you know, prevent climate policy at the same time they want to say this is important to us. And I, you, you got to get rid of that disconnect for, for this to all work. It's, you can't have it both ways. You can't advocate and talk about yourself as a green company and then behind the scenes, not make those choices. And I think the reason is, again, the, a lot of these decisions to sort of put values ahead of profit, they, they don't pay off from a strictly financial perspective, but if you measure your, the health of your business by, you know, what impact did I have on my workers today? What impact did I have on my consumers today? 
Did I create a better environmental outcome? And if those things are true and you take value in those and you're excited about them, then it's really easy to do the right choice. I, I think the only time it's hard is when you don't value, you, you say you value those, but then you don't when it comes time to make action. So for us, it's easy because we're an independent company where you know, we have one shareholder, which is you know, really it's a family of shareholders, but it's one family that owns the company and they can, you know, for them, all those things really matter. You know, the impact they have on a consumer often, I, I, we spend more time talking about that often than our p l you know, and that's, that's because that's for their, you know, that's their, you know, North star in a way. So it's doable, but you just have to change the paradigm that it's only about financial interests alone to, to really achieve it. Absolutely. That makes so much sense. Um, I'm curious, what's your favorite Amy's dish? <laughs> it's like asking what's your favorite child. It's a hard one. I, you know, I've, I've been here so long and through so many different types of products. I have, I, I always have like the favorite of the day, but I think at the end of the day, I always have to give credit to the, to the humble vegetable pot pie, the one that really started the company. And, and, you know, partly it just, you know, we all have our comfort foods, but for me, that pot pie, when I was like, junior high my mom used to bake it in the morning she'd actually bake it not microwave it so it'd be like 45 minutes of baking it and then stuff it into a thermos and then it would sit for four hours in this thermos so like you know there's no more crispy flaky crust it was kind of more of a pot pie mash at that point but somehow just the fact that like my mom baked that for me but it came from my uncle Nance company and it was just like my favorite thing when i got that at you know for my school lunch and so i don't know for some reason the pot pie every time i eat it still like brings me back to those early days and that sense of comfort so oh. I'll answer with that one, but I do love pretty much everything that we make. Uh, depends on the day. That's amazing. Uh, anything else that you'd like to share, add, or or share or impart on listeners? I guess maybe just as a clip. Well, first of all, thank you, Ben, for just advocating for a better world through business. I think this is so important that we talk about business being a solution and what it takes to really do that. Um, and and you know. I guess maybe one thing I'll just close with, I have a mentor and friend, Ken Cook, he's the president of environmental working group. And he'd shared this concept with me a while. And he's like, you know, in the past, when I started in the environmental world, it was all about science would inform regulations because government would actually pay attention to science and agree, agree that science was factual back then. And ultimately those regulations would, uh, sh would govern how businesses show up and ultimately consumers would get the benefit of it. He's like, He's like, that's broken today. Science does not inform regulation anymore. And so really where we're at today is that science will inform consumers and then consumers will choose the businesses that live up to that. And ultimately the regulations will catch up at some point uh, because they need to to create a sort of you know, um, operating business climate. And anyway, I just thought it was a really powerful takeaway. And, and that just, should, again, just how important you know consumers are in this and that they are voting with their dollar. And every time they pick a company that's, doing something a little bit better for the world and their community and for their environment, they are changing the world uh, through that action. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. And again, thank you for helping get that word out because ultimately uh, we will change the world if all businesses start adopting this more purpose-driven approach. So, Oh my goodness. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. This was great. This is amazing. <laughs>